I know Dr. Nettleman didn't want me to introduce him, but I grab a quick bio off his website. So Dr. Nettleman started <laughs> Nettleman Land Consultants to share his love and passion for land surveying with others. From early childhood, Tony began surveying in his family business and had been learning ever since. He brings the knowledge from four-year university degree programs, thousands of hours of experience, and hundreds of land disputes to land surveyors, attorneys, property owners, and nationwide. Nettleman graduated from, with honors from New Mexico State University with a Bachelor's of Science in Land Surveying and Engineering, a Master's of Science in Geospatial Engineering from Texas A&M Corpus Christi, with honors and a PhD in Geomatics from the University of Florida, and as a Juris Doctor at University International University, Florida International University. So, Dr. Nettleman, wow. thank you for joining us. We uh, truly appreciate it, and uh, we looking forward to today. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, that's quite a mouthful. It is. It is. I love it. <laughs> well, first of all, I, I'm glad everyone's here. You know, it's, it's always fun, uh, you know, meeting up and talking about what we what we enjoy. And tonight we're just going to start off with just a really basic introduction to water boundaries. Uh, I posted an updated set of slides in the chat window. So feel free to download those slides. Make sure they work OK. And can everybody see my full screen here? They're not, they're looking at the full slideshow. Okay, great. Technology, my grandfather spent his entire life cursing technology and everyone just rolled their eyes. And now I feel like I've spent the past year cursing technology, you know, Zoom meetings and all this, rest of this stuff, but it's always fun. So <laughs> I enjoy technology for the sake of doing things easier and faster and cheaper. I don't enjoy technology for the sake of buying new stuff to make more technology. I guess that's fair, right? So we're glad you're here. You know, uh, I'm excited you're here. Feel free to, um, you know, chime in when you have questions. Uh, but I'm glad you're here because we're going to have fun talking about all kinds of stuff. Tidal water boundaries, non-tidal water boundaries, allocations, all kinds of random stuff. And this is typically up to an eight hour presentation. So we're gonna run the first hour of this, uh, which is the introduction, kind of a general overview. And then if you're interested in more specific things, just keep an eye out. I run this course about once a year and I'm sure Trent will be glad to forward this to you the next time it runs. Um, because when we have eight hours, we have a lot of time to go into specifics about everything. So we'll spend an hour on title, an hour on non-title, an hour on private versus public rights and all these great topics. Um, glad you're here. And if you guys want to, you're welcome to have your video going. And I'll tell you a trick. If you press down on your space bar when we're in Zoom, you'll unmute yourself just while the space bar is pressed. I learned that as a trick just recently. And if you have a question, just hold down the space bar and you can tell me your question. We're here today because we like water boundaries. It's fun. And uh, personally, I grew up on Lake Lanier. I probably logged like 100,000 hours on my little 15 foot Chris Craft boat. I mean, I pretty much ran over Lake Lanier every weekend for you know, 16, 17 years. And just being on the water is fun. You have you, you your boat, you go fishing, uh, you get to go swimming, go to the cove and hang out with your friends and drink a beer. There's all kinds of great water boundaries, fun. And it's really a shame because, you know, a lot of property owners and a lot of attorneys who litigate uh, riparian boundaries, they've lost the fun. You know, they spend the whole time fighting with their neighbors over a dock, but you want to use the dock to have fun. You don't want to use the dock to harass your neighbor. And I've got a gentleman in Palm Beach, and he's getting ready to build his dock after a multi-year dispute. And I'm pretty certain he's going to build his dock in the shape of a giant middle finger just to frustrate his neighbor that was they've spent, you know, like millions over these, these three docks. Now, another interesting thing I've gotten into recently, I went down to a place, uh, you can Google this, Jack Brown's Seaplane Base in Winter Haven. And they're on a chain of lakes in central Florida. 
and I got a seaplane rating last year. And if you think boating is fun, try seaplane yeah. flying because you can fly around, you can land on pretty much any lake in central Florida, and you can pull up to a beach, you can go have a, a lunch at a um, restaurant on the water. And it really surprises people when everyone's in a boat and you pull up in a seaplane. <laughs> It confuses them. Like, what the hell is this plane doing parked next to 20 boats? So, uh, you know, a lot of fun going on in the water. And I hope that as a surveyor, if you get into riparian boundaries, that you remember, you know, not to lose the fun of the water getting busy carving up uh, rights for property owners, because, uh, you know, just make sure you can still see the forest and you're not staring at one of the trees. Uh, as I said before, today is going to be um, just an introduction to water boundaries. We'll talk about lots of different topics. And the purpose of today is really just kind of spark your interest. And, you know, most surveyors will never survey a water boundary in their life, or they'll do one of them out of 100 and they'll really muck up the job. So, Let's try to focus on um, kind of an overview, and then I encourage you to go out and, you know, find your favorite topics after the show's over and learn more about them, because, you know, for every minute we spend on a topic, you could spend a year, you know, learning about the different topics. And it's funny, I've been carving up water boundaries for years, and it seems like every case I get, I get a different perspective, like, darn, that's an amazing case for in Florida. I wish I would have had that case two years ago in the other dispute. So I'm constantly learning and relearning and trying to hone my riparian surveying skills. And even if after you've done it for years, you've never, never mastered it. So a couple of housekeeping rules. Uh, anybody can interrupt at any time. Just turn on your mic or turn on your uh, video as well if you can. Ask a question. There's no interruptions. We're just here learning it together. So definitely, uh, I would appreciate your help turning this from a lecture into an interactive kind of environment. So I encourage you guys to say something. Uh, don't hold it to the end. Second, have fun. Uh, don't take it too seriously. Third, think about how you can apply this stuff in your own practice, because it seems like, you know, land boundary surveying, people call up, what's your price? What's your price? They call everybody in the phone book. What's your price? Well, it's funny, whenever anybody calls me for a survey, I'm their last resort. They've called everybody else and nobody wants to get involved in testifying against another surveyor. Nobody wants to get involved in a riparian allocation. So they've exhausted all of their options. And it's funny, I found out that I never get a job in the state where I live. You know, I lived in Texas for years and I still do part of the year, never got a good case. Uh, I spend part of my year in North Carolina on the East Coast. I get Texas cases all the time. I lived in Florida for years as a PhD student and a law student. I had one or two cases during that time. Now I have like 10 and, I, and I'm nowhere near Florida most of the year. So why would they pay me to travel all this way? Because they can't find anybody else to do this and write the report. And last but not least, I make it a rule to find a nugget of information in every class that I take. You could sit through an eight hour class and this five minute nugget is all you take away. That's great. I signed up for a course with Gary Kent a few weeks ago and I had to keep leaving the course, keep leaving, I got phone calls, there was a problem in the office, all this stuff. So I was like sitting here watching this, the screen um, with no audio and he, he showed me an Ohio, an, an Ohio case about a title attorney that I've been searching for for like a year. I needed a good case to show that a title attorney had an obligation to review the title before he sent it off. The case was on the screen right there. And it, he like even highlighted the, the sentence I needed. 
And I just stopped everything and screen captured that case. And I called the attorney as I said, I've got your case. This is it. Well, I didn't get anything out of poor Gary's presentation except that one case. It was so worth the 125 bucks or whatever ridiculous price he charged, you know, 100 bucks for a course is like 10 cents. So think about it. What kind of nugget you're going to get out of this course and, you know, just keep your antennas up to find that one piece of information. Okay, this is, these goals are a little bit optimistic because these are the goals for the eight hour course, but we'll definitely talk about a lot of this stuff like water boundary movements, uh, some interesting court cases. And I've had so many people who tell me the meander of their water body is the boundary and I don't think they understand meanders are for measuring area. They were never really for, you know, setting property lines in a lot of these places. So hopefully we'll um, appreciate that. So why are water boundaries so complex? Well, water boundaries are also known as ambulatory boundaries. And can anyone tell me what does the word ambulatory actually mean? It's, uh, it can move. Moving, yeah, it just it means a moving boundary. So if you have an ambulatory boundary, that translates directly to moving boundary. So if you do a survey for a person in 2015, and now it's 2021, that's going to be quite different in some places, depending on the geology, the hydrography, all these things. Had a friend call me recently in, in South Florida and his client was a marina. Marina wanted to get another land lease from the state of Florida. God bless those people. And he said, the, the business owner wants me just to restamp my 2010 survey and, and mark it as 2021 on the signature. Should I do it? I said, I, that's a pretty bad idea, you know, overall, because think of the surveyor you were in 2010, and it should probably, if you are a decent surveyor, it should scare you because you must have learned a lot in 11 years. He says, yeah, but they, they don't want to spend the money and all this, you know, stuff. He said, what should I do? I said, if it were me, I would not restamp that survey from 11 or 12 years ago. So he didn't. And he charged him, you know, a couple thousand bucks to redo the survey. Well, it turns out the one of the property corners that he showed on his original survey was completely bogus because there was an AutoCAD error or something. And can you imagine if he would have just restamped that survey and got, and there could have been major, major permitting problems with Florida, bad stuff. So appreciate that water boundaries are constantly moving. Also appreciate that as a surveyor, how often do we deal with like, like uh, sonar, underwater measurements, hydrography, all this, this is like, um, like a completely different field than land surveying. And there are degrees in hydrologic surveying and things like that, um, where the traditional surveyor never does any of this stuff. I mean, I've gotten um, three land surveying degrees, a bachelor's, master's, PhD. I was never on a boat with an underwater sounder and like 300 credit hours of courses. So just because you're licensed to do, to do some of this stuff does not mean you're qualified without further courses or, or uh, experience. And finally, judges have a hard time understanding like angles. I mean, if, if you had to explain what is an azimuth to a judge, you've never been so frustrated. We'll try explaining the difference between accretion and avulsion. Mm -hmm. So this can get real muddy because you're the expert, like you're the surveyor, you know all these terms and you're loaded with information, but it's like trying to speak French to someone who speaks Japanese. Like, you know, it, it's just, it's a language barrier. 
So you're going to have to, if you do write a survey report for a dispute or something else, you're going to have to really start off with the basics. You know, start with the basics and then build your pyramid of knowledge where at the very top you've got your ultimate conclusion, you know, your ultimate um, decision. But it, you got to build the pyramid of all the basic terms and the basic um, how water boundaries work and all this stuff. And this is why a lot of surveyors do not work on water boundaries because it takes a lot of education, takes a lot of experience, takes a lot of patience. And sometimes it can be as much of an art as a science because you're given some basic constraints and then it's up to you to figure out what's going on. And you know, sometimes reasonable people can disagree. What is the difference? What what is the definition of a tidal water body? Joshua, you've been so quiet. You just sit there and I know you're paying attention, but can you tell me what difference is? Can you tell me what a tidal water body is? And you got to unmute yourself first. Don't forget. Yeah, would have been a better answer if I stayed muted. <laughs> Theoretically, I'm going to take a stab and have something to do with affected by solar, stars, moon, things like that. Yeah, I'll take that. Subject to tidal cycles, Connie says. So it's basically if it's affected by the moon and the pull of the earth and all this stuff, it's a tidal water body. And if it's not affected by the moon or the, you know, spin of the pull of the earth, all this stuff, it's non-tidal. But this gets kind of complicated because like where I've been in for several years in Florida, there's like brackish water where it's like a tidal versus non-tidal coming together and all this stuff. Basically, if you're in that situation, call the state, the state environmental protection agency, let them tell you. They, they, I bet you they have a list of tidal and non-tidal water bodies and let them deal with the heavy lifting. All right, what about a navigable body of water? What makes a, a water body navigable? Anybody? Good pick. I, I could do a real long-winded one of that. Tony, I was a <coughs> chief cadastral surveyor for Alaska for 10 years. So, um, <laughs> yeah, well, our water is a four-letter word, but uh, <laughs> I, title, T-I-T-L-E purposes, you know, there's at the federal level, there's determinations of navigability based on the essentially the Daniel Ball case is the primary precedence. And you're talking about the like navigable in fact, navigable by law, things like that. Right, right. Now, something that blew my, my mind was I read in a magazine article in a law journal recently, there, there's a difference between a um, navigable for sakes of ownership versus navigable for a sake of regulation. So like waters of the US, like every, like a puddle could be navigable by their crazy definition. But um, for navigability in terms of ownership purposes, it could be defined by the state, like in Texas, it's 30 feet wide or wider, uh, or it could be navigable in fact, which is the Daniel Ball case we'll talk about, where basically today, if you can float a toothpick for commerce, it's navigable. I like that, Brian. I was going to say float a log, but even logs you know, end up as toothpicks eventually. Well, yeah, actually, it has to be, you know, navigable for commerce uh, at the date of statehood, which is the, the key thing. So, you know, it had to be a common, you know, type of craft in, in our state. It's 1959. So something like a jet boat. That, <laughs> it's a big, uh, that's a big contention the state of Alaska is making that some of these modern wa watercraft, whether they're, uh, you know, a, a rubber you know, raft for whitewater or a jet boat or so forth, weren't available for travel, trade, and commerce in 1959. That's interesting. Landon, do you have a question? Go for it. 
you don't you don't have to raise your hand just unmute yourself and start talking over everybody yeah no, I, your... I don't, I don't want to do that i talk too much most of the time anyway <laughs> so um but I, i'm curious what you think um so i haven't had to deal with this yet in my practice specifically but you know what what i always what i always try and and uh, do for my clients is not put them in a position where they're they're taking on some uncertainty or some risk unless they they know that. So I think if if I was doing a survey along a body of water here in California, and I wasn't sure if it was navigable or not, I would want to know what the adjoiner was going to assert. And in this case, if it was navigable, that would be our state lands commission. So I'd probably want to talk to those folks and find out, and if possible, get some get maybe get a decision in writing on that. Um, you know what. I, what I wouldn't want to do is make a decision one way or the other and, and, you know, hang my kahunas on that and potentially cause harm to my landowner. Um, unless, yes. unless they've been fully advised. So I'm just curious how that's you, good. That's a good how comment. You handle that. You know, if, if do you make yeah. those determinations or, and when you do, who do you consult with and kind of what your process is? That's a fantastic question. So no land surveyor has the ability to call it navigable or non-navigable. They have to call their state lands people or this in Florida, it's the DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection. And they keep a list of all the navigable rivers and lakes and all this stuff. And it's so funny because um, if you're a seaplane pilot, you can buy this little book and it has all of the like public areas to fly into. So they don't want you landing on a non-navigable pond or something. So all the navigable ponds and lakes and stuff in Florida, in North Carolina, in all these states are in this book. So you like, do I want to land here? Well, you pull out the book. Oh, this this is not navigable. This is not on the list. You can't land here. So definitely consult your state agency. Do not make that determination on your own. How about has accretion or avulsion occurred. Now we'll talk a lot about this in the, in the longer course, but basically if the body of water has moved slowly, then the property boundary has moved with it. If the body of water has moved like real fast, then the, the ownership is locked into where it was before the event happened, like an oxbow broke or a hurricane came through so just remember slow versus fast in terms of movement. Does the state or federal government have sovereignty over the beds? Uh, some questions for Western guys, not so much for the East Coast. What about artificial structures? You know, this really depends on state versus state because if some guy builds like a dam and makes a pond and now he claims all his neighbor's land is his, <laughs> That's probably not going to fly, but basically, if you if the owner did not cause the change in water body, um, he usually can benefit from it, but it sort of depends. And same thing for the federal government question, reemerged lands, swamps and islands uh, could be a question, but that's a little more advanced uh, than to worry about today. Here is uh, what Michael Schroeder was talking about, these cases where we're basically asking ourselves, is, is the body of water suitable in its ordinary condition as a highway of commerce? That's, that's a good phrase to remember, highway of commerce, at the time the state is admitted. And You've got further cases which talk about like the natural state, but gosh, it seems like recently over the past hundred years, courts have bent over backwards to show that a body of water is navigable. They want it to be navigable. Why is that? Why, Mr. Schroeder, why, why does the government want the, the rivers to be navigable? Well, in our case, I mean, we were just doing it as the first regional surveys out of federal, but, you know, so I don't know that the federal government has an interest, certainly the states do, because they are truly, like you said, important to have a continuous means of, of transport or use of a, of a river it was like a highway, especially in the early ages. And yeah, so exactly. It provides benefits to the public to you know, travel 
distances along that river, enjoy the use of it as a, as a body of water. There was a lady who tried to, in Georgia, where the Chattahoochee connects to Lake Lanier, she tried to put like a, a fence uh, around her part of the Chattahoochee to block her. Stay the hell out of my, you know, land. This is my river. You know, can you imagine? Chattahoochee is a big river. It's not like a little guy. So the state wants all the water bodies to be navigable because the state wants them to be in trust for the public. Everybody gets to boat. Everybody gets to fish. Everybody gets to have a good time. And um, depending on the state, they're more or less um, fierce about that. But like California, Florida, they want all the bo water bodies to be open to the public because, you know, that's a, a real big source of revenue and, and joy of being in the state. When rivers, lakes, uh, streams, whatever, are non-navigable, then the owners own to the center of the bed. But when rivers, lakes, whatever, are navigable, then it's going to be um, to the banks. Could be the mean low water, uh, ordinary high water, ordinary low water, whatever. So if this lake is non-navigable, then the nearby guys, they get to all carve up this lake and share it. But who decides what's a fair carving? Who do they call when they want to figure out how much of this lake do I actually own? What do you think, Landon? Who are they going to call? Well, Nick, you, here's the deal. You, you just asked the wrong guy that question. So what I would what I would probably try and do is is figure out what the, the alternative methods like I know there's like the long lake method and then there's the pie method or whatever. And then but what I really think you need to do is you need to try and get some agreement with the neighbors. So um, there's no way I would I would monument come up with a solution and monument it like that if I didn't have agreement with the neighbors. Because um, again, you like a, you're an optimist, it sounds like, you know, do you get along with everybody else? Are you, are you pretty friendly? You know, you know what? Part of the, what I deal with here is we're in such a really litigious state. Um, and, <laughs> and what I tell people is, hey, you got to decide. You know, over and over again, I see surveyors, uh, you know, hang their livelihood on a particular solution. And I don't feel like they're getting paid to take that risk, you know? So I'm always trying to tell surveyors, like, Nobody appointed you boundary god with a with, you know you can just <laughs> run around with a with a sledgehammer set monuments and fix some problems right so like that's funny yeah you know I, anytime I like I that in a situation like that I'd be wanting to get agreement from the neighbors and here's what I tell people if we're in, let's just say whatever I chose the Long Lake method and the neighbor didn't like my solution right um, I'd tell my client I, sorry I can't I can't I can't monument this line I can't fully resolve this boundary. Here's a couple, here's a good land attorney I know, or here's two good land attorneys I know. Let's call them. You maybe you need a quiet title action or something. You know, so I, th I think, you know, whatever you open, whatever book it is, and it's got the different methods you could use to apportion ac accretions or whatever. Like I thought me, you were going to say Pandora's box. <laughs> yeah. To me, that that's the starting point. It's not the end point, right? Like that gives you some possible solutions you could talk with the adjoiners about. That's great. That's a great answer. And I love that boundary god. Never even heard of that term before, right? That may be a good calling card, you know, Tony Nettleman, boundary god. <laughs> That's funny. So, yeah, I mean, you know, they're going to call the local land surveyor, the surveyors carve up property and say, carve up this lake and keep these assholes, neighbors off of my, you know, quarter, you know, get off my slice. That's what they're going to say. And I love your answer, Landon, because that's exactly what a lot of surveyors say when they get a call about a riparian boundary. Uh, number one, I think I know some methods, but I'm not exactly sure. Number two, this is not worth my money to get involved in a carving up, let alone get involved in a legal dispute. Like this sounds like this is not going to work out for me. And third, uh, there's a lot of liability in here. So if one of the neighbors doesn't like it, then we're going to have a real problem. 
And if you don't feel comfortable doing it, don't do it. You know, a lot of surveyors get like pushed into doing things with their clients. And I just had to testify against a guy and, and another guy in Palm Beach, a surveyor, because his client told him exactly how to carve up the riparian boundary. He put it on paper and he stamped it. How did you do it? My client told me where it was. <laughs> okay, that was a good deposition. It was funny. And then the guy says, is this your survey, sir? Yeah, it is. But I'm not finished with it yet. I'll let you know what happens next week. <laughs> and it was already signed and stamped and everything. Nope, this is just a draft. This is a draft. <laughs> but that was a good out. You know, this guy's like, I'm, I don't want to be here. I don't like being here. I don't want to be involved in this. I'm out. So he, he's probably uh, not interested. So this is a, the last slide for the intro is going to be, I'm not going to go through everything here. I just want you guys to, to open your eyes to how many different industries rely on the water. You've got a fisherman, you've got um, a beachfront development, you've got farmers, sewage plant, skiers, a wildlife area. I mean, there are so many competing interests along the water. And it, um, I um, interned with the river keepers in Miami for about a year during law school, and they brought so many lawsuits against so many different people. I mean, they were suing power companies, they were suing the state, they were suing the city of Miami, they were suing the marina. I mean, just lawsuits everywhere um, over who gets to use what riparian rights and who gets to you know do things in the river. It was very interesting. So keep in mind, most of the stuff I work on is residential, you know, along rivers, lakes, the um, intercoastal, but there are a lot more places um, which require um, our services. And funny story, I just did a riparian allocation for a marina in Stewart, Florida, and these people's problem is is that their boats are so big that they stick out even beyond their land lease in Florida. And they were in the public kind of right of way. And it's like, you know, 40, I think like a 40 foot boat's a decent sized boat. You know, I, I used to go fishing on a 25 foot center console in the Gulf Stream for years. And I thought it was a pretty comfortable boat. Well, these guys are in like 50, 60, 80, 110 foot boats. You got to have some real area. You need some re riparian area to fit a 120 foot boat. And if you have 10 of them in the same marina, then things get real crowded. So always ask your client, like, why are they getting this survey done? And what's the purpose? Because maybe the boat's not there today, but 110 feet sticking out into the, uh, you know, Loxahatchee River could be a serious issue. Tony, you might uh, you might have a client that wants 110 foot boat, and uh, but all he can get in his, in his land is a hundred footer. So you're going to have to charge him for the difference between the two. <laughs> yep, and you know you have to set expectations because a lot of clients they want something they can't have, and they they expect you to give it to them because they're paying you a lot of money. You know, well I'm going to pay you 50 grand for a repairing allocation. And I want to be able to fit a 110 foot boat. And I just tell people, well, the evidence is the evidence. And I can't tell you what it'll be until we do the survey. And we'll just see what happens at the end. So when you do that, you should probably get a pretty large retainer in case they don't want to pay you at the end. You still have plenty of money. And I can do a whole seminar on business practices because uh, my grandfather, who I worked for for many years, I mean, he just wouldn't bill anybody. He didn't care. He just wanted to have fun and do surveys and he wouldn't bill people for years. And I, and I learned those mistakes. So I've, I've learned to get a retainer up front and I never bill against the retainer until the very end of the survey. So like they pay everything at the end and then they get their, you know, five or 10,000 bucks back for their retainer once it's all settled. Because... Um, <clears throat> Because water boundaries are so um, unique, you never know how it's going to end up. And 
you want your client to be happy, but you also have to get paid at the same time, which is interesting. Get a 50% retainer from every client, Landon says. That's great. Yep. I usually get a retainer for two days worth of work, which is about $12,000. So get a ten dollars or $12,000 retainer, hold on to it for a while until the end of the dispute. It works out pretty well. I, I probably have not lost $1,000 in the past two or three years from non-paying clients. So it does work, but you've got to have an administrative person. I'm not the one that calls around to collect money. So let's keep going and talk. Let's talk about some history because you're going to be shocked at just how little water boundaries have changed over like 2000 years. You could have been a surveyor in Rome, could be a surveyor in Egypt, could be a surveyor in Victorian England. And yeah, things were different, but they weren't that different. And it, it kind of surprised me just how similar um, these systems really are. Is anyone familiar with Justinian? Ever heard of this guy, Justinian? Landon shaking his head, yes. The lawgiver. You know, he did a lot of things. He did a lot of laws like the arts. He built a bunch of um, uh, entertainment facilities in Rome. But Justinian was really Rome's last um, emperor or one of the last before it broke up. And Roman law has really been the basis for civil law in Europe. And it's Roman law is still a lot of the laws in Europe. And it's come over to the US part of the way. But water boundary law has really combined on like one side is civil law, which is European. On the other side is common law, which is English. And it's kind of meshed together in the United States to come up with um, some distinctions. Also, um, in Europe, like or even in Britain, they are really obsessed with seasonal things. You know, Egypt had the flow of the Nile. Um, Britain is obsessed with like neap tides versus um, spring tides. But in the U.S., it's really more tidal versus non-tidal. Also. Do not worry yourself about the differences between littoral and riparian. I swear, every book I've read, every case I've read, they say littoral means lakes and riparian means rivers, but it's all the same. So we're going to use them interchangeably. Well, why can't we just do that now? You know, there's no difference. Just use them interchangeably and don't worry about it unless you're writing a PhD dissertation. Okay. Question for the group. If you had the chance to survey the same exact property every year, would you do it? If you had, if there was a situation that required you or required the property owner to retain your services every year at the same time, would you take on the same job year after year? Yes. Are they paying the bill? Yes, they got to pay the bill. Okay, Landon says, yes, he'll do it too. I'm shocked because I ran this water boundary seminar uh, in December for a group of attorneys. They said, no, they didn't want to do the same job every year. And I was shocked because I wouldn't mind doing the same job every year. I mean, with GPS and all this technology, you should be able to say, go put the point back. And that's exactly what the Egyptians had to do because before planting every year, Got to get your property surveyed, do, do your farming, have a good year, make some money. Then the Nile comes, it washes away all the monuments, all the evidence, and you're back out there next year, same time, surveying, and then they plant and they go through the same exact cycle time and time again. And I'm not sure, you know, if we can really appreciate exactly what is 700 million cubic meters of water per day. That's a lot of water. That's like saying a trillion years old. It's just too big for us to comprehend. Um, my question is, 
how much has changed since the last time it's been surveyed? That was uh, Sean's question. I don't know. I mean, the water could have eroded your boundaries. It could have destroyed monumentation. I mean, a lot could have changed or nothing. It just depends on how your property fared during the flood uh, that August, September, October. Who knows? After we get the Egyptian basics of slow versus fast, now we come to Justinian, who really codified this in like a, a law book, which talked about, um, which talked about how this stuff worked. And I'll read you a, a little blurb from Justinian. He says, um, the law of all peoples makes yours any alluvial accretion which a river adds to your land. So if a river adds a piece of land to your property, it's yours. If the river's current rips away a piece of your land and carries it down to your neighbor, it remains yours. So if you can tell it's your land, you can keep it. If after a while it attaches itself to your neighbor's land, and the trees drive in roots into that land, then it will become his land. <laughs> so if it sticks around, it transfers. If it moves back and forth or something else, you get to keep it. Now that's kind of, kind of a weird law, but it's really the basis for accretion versus avulsion, which we have today. Fast forward a thousand years, and now we've got uh, Bracton, the Ire of Nottingham, Callis, and Lord Hale is really the most famous riparian attorney uh, guy because Lord Hale, in his, his opinion, uh, Chambers v. Attorney General, is the basis for the 18.6 year title cycle we use today with the uh, NGS. And Hale, made some distinctions about seasons and stuff like that because he's British. But basically, Hale came up with this like 19 year cycle on how we calculate um, sh movements in tidal water um, heights. And that was, you know, mid 17th century. I think it was later than that. It was like, I think it was like 1800s, but it's been a while. And then, George, and then we've got some early American stuff, which we're not too concerned with. But basically, you've got to ask yourself a few questions. You know, don't worry about a lot of the details. If you're going to do a water boundary, you know, is it tidal or non-tidal? Is it navigable or non-navigable? And is there any special exceptions in the public lands? And if you can answer those three basic things, that'll keep your head pretty much above water <laughs> and, and that'll so get you started yes so this michael just interject again another thing that creates a lot of confusion is that you have meanderable water too so i'm you know talking so, to my past job as a federal guy so rivers that were more than three chains 198 feet or lakes larger than 50 acres were meandered and excluded but not necessarily navigable. So when you see a survey plat and has a river and shown, don't jump in and say, oh, that must have been a navigable river because there's a navigability report that says which of the water bodies <clears throat> fit the navigability criteria. That's a great point. And, and tell the group why surveyors meandered the water bodies. Um, basically it was so that uh, if they had an entry, say they had a homestead that that fronted a water body, they didn't want the chargeability of the acreage under that bed that your example of the lake with the, with the four corners in the middle of it, the ownership, you know, goes to where that point is. So, so, you know, um, our founders there of Jefferson, it was a pretty good strategy as a yeah. help, um, not to charge. You see what time they close? <laughs> Go ahead, Michael. Okay, so it was a pretty good strategy so that these large rivers, they didn't have the 
the ability to make navigability calls, but they just said, hey, anything that's larger than those criteria, lakes larger than 50 or uh, rivers larger than three chains, 198 feet, we're just gonna segregate out. Um, and the federal interest still may be in that land because they didn't patent it out to any of the upland owners. That's great. And I have so many attorneys who are like, well, I see a meander and that must be my boundary. Well, let's just hold on a minute. Now, once we get to the point of I, I can do a water boundary, I'm competent enough to find the boundary of the river, uh, the lake, whatever. Then you got to ask yourself, well, why are people calling you for a survey? Well, they want to build a dock. They want to prevent their neighbor from building his dock. They want to access the water. They want to go fishing on the shoreline. They want all these riparian rights. And it's important to remember that all riparian law, just like land law, is state specific. So you can't take a Florida you know, methodology and apply it to South Carolina. You can't take an Alaska methodology and take it to California. And the scary thing is, is that pretty much all of the riparian law that I've seen is in cases. You know, you have to read these court cases and Florida, um, South Carolina, um, Ohio, these states where I practice a lot of the time, you, there is no statute about how to allocate riparian rights between landowners. Um, and you have to go to the court cases and read them and understand them because uh, I keep going out to Florida because I do so many Florida riparian boundary surveys. There's probably three or four cases which explain everything. Now, uh, Landon says, that means you should write us a book based on case law. <laughs> no. You don't want my advice because um, I am only an interpreter. I, I don't, I, I'm not allowed to make judgments on case law. It's all it is, is my opinion. And, you know, a lot of the time people take my opinion and use it, but it doesn't mean um, it's right. If you were an attorney, if I said build a dock, you would think declaratory judgment. If you said use a dock, quiet title. If I said access the water, well, can I eject these people from accessing my water? And that's kind of fun because we do a lot of these uh, water boundary seminars for both attorneys and um, surveyors at the same time. Our clients are usually arguing for their dock against the neighbor's dock. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And um, a lot of the time, the neighbors do not want to see the other neighbor's dock. You know, they will spend, I, I have a case uh, in Orlando on a beautiful set of lakes, Lake Butler chain, and the people have spent collectively probably $3 million because the neighbor can look out his house and see the other dock. Like he doesn't want any peripheral dock vision. He's got to get out of my property. Well, how do you know it's your riparian rights? Well, I don't care. It's, I don't want to, I have a right. I have a constitutional right not to look at my neighbor's dock. And it just goes on and on. So, you know, everybody has the right to have an opinion, but um, we'll leave it at that. Yes, the realtor told, it, told me it was mine. Don't even joke about that. That's just, that's the God's truth. I mean, and I had these two ladies in Georgia and their attorney hired me to do a, a case review because I do not take any cases where I have not um, fully vetted everything about it. And these two ladies were told by a realtor that they owned this like fence line. And there was not one iota of evidence that they owned this fence line. <laughs> Nothing. No, I mean, no, no, the plat was clear. The deed was clear. The fence line has nothing to do with anything. And these women went on this guy's property and tore out a bunch of trees and were building trails and all. <laughs> what are you women doing? <clears throat> Our realtor told us. <laughs> and the, the, um, the surveyor told me, he said, you know, Tony, you sound like an honest guy. I'll tell you the truth. 
these damn women realtors run around and they sell this land up here in North Georgia to these dumb Yankee Atlantans, you know, coming down here. And the women realtors will tell the other women that like, you know, God walked on water in this pond and that's why it's costing, you know, $10,000 an acre. They'll tell them anything. So we joke about that, but it's true. The realtors will tell you anything to get you to purchase. All right. Our hour is almost up. So I just wanted to go in and remind you guys, there are two things to answer. So first of all, here is um, some land and here is, we'll say some water over here. So we'll, you know, the land is to the south, the water is to the north. You've got two questions to answer. Number one, where is the boundary between state land and private land if this is a navigable body of water? So is it mean high tide? Is it um, ordinary high water? You know, where is the line from private to state boundary? And that is that question is in the direction or away from the, the body of water versus the shore. Now, the other question is, if you've got multiple property owners, the second question is, how do you allocate these riparian rights among the other property owners? So the first question is state versus private property, which is like a lateral question. And then the allocation between neighbors is like a, a left and right horizontal question. And you've got to do both of those things if you're going to do a riparian survey. Now, is it mean high water, mean low water, ordinary low water? Buy a book, go to a presentation if you want that answered because it's a topic for longer than an hour. What method do I use to allocate the riparian boundaries? The Long Lake method, the colonial method, the Cove method, buy a book or come to another seminar because we're not gonna answer that tonight either, but just be aware there are allocation methods between neighbors and there are also methods for determining the state versus private shoreline in this direction. Now, I hope that has wet your tongue to water boundaries. Uh, who here thinks, well, first of all, let me ask you guys, who here currently does water boundary surveys? You call up, you'll do a riparian survey. If you do, say yes in the chat. We'll get a little tally going here. I call you up, uh, whether you're in Nevada or California or wherever, and will you do me a riparian survey? And how many people are here tonight, Trent? There's 32 on right now. 32. So four out of 32. That's pretty, five. One, two, three, four, five. Jesse says, <laughs> if I have a boat payment due, I'll probably do it for you. Otherwise, go away. <laughs> <laughs> Retired, but would. Okay, Michael, uh, Mr. Schroeder would do that. That's great. So we have what, like five or six? One, two, three, four. Uh, did somebody all change your answers? One, two, three, four. Four out of 32 would do that. So let's do that math here. And four divided by 32, that's about a, a 12 percent um group now two who, of them are in florida <laughs> yeah my i have this surveyor in florida he does the worst repairing allocations like he makes up his own method and you never know what he's going to do and i've testified against him like five or six times over the past decade and my wife says you got to call the board and report him for all this because he's cost people millions of dollars in headaches and i said why would I, you, you got to appreciate there. My friend said he worked, my friend worked at Bank of America for a long time. He said, there are two types of people. There are known assholes and there are unknown assholes. You want the known asshole because you know his tricks. Like, you know what he's going to do every time. And I, I told my wife, I said, you know, this gentleman has purchased you a new car, a, a cabin, uh, all kinds. I mean, your lifestyle would not be what it is today without this gentleman in your life. He may be a pain 
and he may cause all kinds of trouble up and down Florida, but he is the best thing that probably ever happened to us <laughs> because he comes up again and again, and he does his crazy tricks all the time. So four out of 32, that's 12%. Now, if you guys had enough resources, like a couple courses or, or a book or something else, and would you do a riparian survey? So you said no already, you, don't, you won't do it today, but would you be interested in doing it if you knew more about how to do it? How many would, do, how many would say yes to that? They won't do it today, but they would do it later if they had the resources. Okay, look at that, huge difference. And that, that is also very interesting to me because a lot of surveyors I know just turn them down, will not do riparian surveys, not really interested. They know it's kind of outside their area of competence and they have enough work they don't need to get a new area going to, to stay profitable. But, you know, I can tell you that um, it's always fun to do they're always interesting. It takes a lot of research before you could ever go to the field, you know, probably half field time and half research before that. And um, I always like to do them because it's always different. You know, the lake is shaped differently. The river has a contour. The bathymetry is very different. Like there's a big sandbar in front of this guy's house. And in Florida, I'm going to... Um, yeah. Now, Rob McMillan, where do you live, Rob? Well, normally I'm in Southern California, but this week I'm in uh, Cape Coral, Florida, sitting on a oh. dock watching the mullet jump. I love that. Yes, yeah, both great places to be. <laughs> so, yeah, definitely. We'll, we'll keep you in mind because I, I have a, a great surveyor I work with in Florida, but I hired a guy in Texas to be my kind of help me, you know, bring his field crew out and it didn't work out very well last year. So I, I need to keep a few guys names on speed dial here and um, use you again and again. Now I'm going to end this presentation with sharing with you one of my favorite cases here in Florida. And whenever I go do a survey, um, I pull up this case because if you want to read a great case, read, uh, I'm going to put this in the chat menu, Hayes, v bowman because this is one of the cases where the judge is like a poet you know he and he he says this i'm going to blow it up here it is absolutely impossible to formulate a mathematical or geometrical rule that can be applied to all situations of this nature the angles of side lines of lots bordering navigable waters are limited only by the number of points on a compass rose. Wow, what eloquence. I mean, this guy, this is like uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, you know, blows your mind. And then, now he stole this from another, from another case a few years ago, but he talks about, um, where is this? Here we go. There are three things to consider. And I don't know why this isn't highlighted. We need to highlight this too. But he says, in making such equitable distribution, the court must necessarily give due consideration to one, the lay of the upland shoreline, two, the direction of the channel, and three, co-relative rights of adjoining landowners. And whenever I do a survey in Florida, I just take those three things and I figure them out one by one. This is a three-pronged test. Now it says the court, but I just figure I'm boundary God, so I can take this too and use it. And, you know, well, what is the shape of the shoreline? Is it, is it uh, straight? Is it irregular? Is it a, a pie shape? What's the shape of the shoreline? Number two, the direction of the channel. In Florida, the channel is key. The number one right 
everybody has is access to navigable water. So no matter what happens, if you're on a navigable body of water, you get channel access. And then three, the co-relative rights of adjoining property owners. Well, if I choose a line, am I going to impede the channel access, the view, the docking, wharfing of other landowners? Well, I hope not, because just because I give my client something does not mean that I can take similar things away from neighbors. So who told me to use this method? Nobody. I just found the case. It was a great case. It has the three elements and I used it. And that's exactly what you'll have to do. Go find out what the elements are. Now, could a court overturn my boundary? Absolutely it could. It's allowed to. Thank God it never has yet, but it could. Because I have no rights. I'm just here as a surveyor carving things up for people. And um, it is what it is. All right. Who's got some questions? Apparently nobody. <laughs> you guys are quite as church mice. <laughs> so, so I'll fill, fill in the blanks here with a shameless plug because uh, I did. I approved a lot of federal surveys in those nine years. I mean, sure. And and I was only protested on three surveys. And the one that I'm going to talk about on May 17th is a very strange riparian right because it was a, a boundary of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And it was a left bank of, of a thread of a distributory stream that was, you know, 10 feet wide. And there's hundreds of millions of dollars of oil and gas. We did it right. We are affirmed with the IBLA. It was protested and denied and then went on. But uh, it's one of those deals, like you were saying, you better have all of your ducks in a row when you're dealing with some of these high dollar value riparian boundaries, especially if they're ambulatory. That's great. Yeah, that's a good point. And it's funny how many surveyors do not like being challenged. Like if they hear this is a, like a dispute or something, they, they'll just pass on it and go do their job. They don't want to deal with the hassle of a court case. But what's interesting is every survey I've ever done has been litigated because I don't take landowner clients. I only take attorneys who need a property dispute um, opinion. So um, I just took over evidence and procedure, uh, Clark and Browns this year. Uh, and I love the quote, even from like when I went to school, I said, you, everything you do must be able to withstand collateral attack. So can your riparian survey withstand the best collateral attack? Like they go out and they hire another national expert. Can you really defend what you're doing completely? And if you say, well, it could be X or it could be Y, then this is a poor <laughs> survey. <laughs> you know, we can't, no ambiguity. And if there is some ambiguity, explain it in the survey report and then explain why you came to your determination. It was like nothing's a hundred percent, but I feel like most of the stuff I do is like 90, 95 percent, very confident, but it's measurements, so it's not a hundred percent. Here, here in northern Nevada, we have a really, really nice situation. We have beautiful Lake Tahoe with million dollar homes and a state line that runs down the middle of the lake. That is and crazy. The, and the, the law for the determination of boundary is low water in Nevada and high water in California. And the lake has its own datum to determine those values. It's, it's really interesting, uh, but it's, it's a crazy situation to get into because there's a lot of liability if you screw it up. Yes, and you know you have to be very certain of yourself, number one, but also you have to charge for what it's worth. You know, I, I did a survey on a, a lit, on a oceanfront property here in Palm Beach just recently, and the lot sold for six million dollars. You know, it's bare lot. It's like an acre. Six million dollars an acre. It's a great property. It's beautiful. But six million bucks is a lot of money. And 
you think, well, I'm going to charge $100,000 for a survey. Well, what percentage of that? What is 100,000 over 6 million? Nothing, nothing like 0. 0.00 something, maybe. So, you know, if you're going out and you're doing a $1,000 survey on a million dollar lot, then this may not work out math wise because you're going to get called on it. If, you're, if the neighbors don't like it, they're going to call you out and they're going to drag you in and make you testify about all the things you did. And if you forgot to, you know, place a monument, if you didn't put the proper north arrow, if you don't have a graphic and a written scale, they're going to nitpick you to death. I mean, they're going to hire a lot of people to tear your survey apart. And that's why I have like at least one or two other professional surveyors review everything I do because they find stupid junk, you know, and they, why not? I mean, have somebody else look at your work. Well, and, and, keep it up. and that's something uh, I think Trent and anybody else that's listen to my soapbox speech on here is as surveyors and engineers, we're not very good at charging for the value we provide our clients. Uh, exactly. We've, we've given yep. away all the technology that we've, we've gained over the last 30, 40 years. I mean, we're charging less for our topo now for a piece of property than we did 40 years ago. Just, just because we could get it done quicker doesn't mean the value is less. It's probably worth more. The <laughs> and the, the realtor's fees on that's four hundred and twenty thousand dollars and that's why they're driving brand new model year mercedes and <laughs> yeah. old pickup trucks exactly. that's so funny yep that's amazing exactly. we got some questions here um better money working for attorneys yep and attorneys uh also get paid because attorneys have things like boat payments and things like that you know they have a lifestyle to maintain any interesting rules about islands? You know, not really. I mean, if you want to find an interesting case, look at uh, Missouri versus Kentucky and Wolf Island, where the Missouri-Kentucky border said it was, the, it was the center of the channel. But there were actually two channels that ran around Wolf Island. So they said, well, which channel is it? Because somebody owns Wolf Island, either Missouri or Kentucky, and we don't know who. So there was a U.S. Supreme Court case about who owned Wolf Island, and it was pretty interesting. They had a lot of like testimony from locals and army maps and just a ton of evidence. So nothing really special about islands. How does this apply to aquifers? Lorraine, I don't know, but that could be a Ph.D. dissertation. I can definitely see that. <laughs> Unique and new questions. And uh, don't we have uh, don't we have a chunk of. Uh... Nevada that's in Arizona and vice versa based on the Colorado River movement? Well, I just watched uh, How the States Got Their Shapes, the first episode ever. And they're talking about the Tennessee, North Carolina. I was Tennessee. No, it was Tennessee and Georgia, I think, or something. Tennessee and Georgia, because the line of latitude was incorrect by like 10 miles or something ridiculous. They're still fighting. It, 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 yeah. Surveyors need to stop undercutting. We need a boater's lifestyles. <laughs> See, now this is the thing. If you do riparian surveys, there's no one going to be to undercut you. Do they want it or not? There are not going to be a hundred other surveyors lining up because there are lots of surveyors who will absolutely cut your price by hundred dollars to get the job, not in riparian. And the other good thing is if you do surveys in preparation for litigation, you do a survey of a land that's in dispute right now, the undercutting price guys will not get involved because they know their shoddy work will be found out you know, in open court. Had a guy who copied a legal description from a deed on a survey, but he accidentally copied the neighbor's legal description and not the property he surveyed. It was really confusing for a minute. We laughed so hard. Um, yeah, watch out for uh, emerged or reemerged. That's a good one. And that would be a great topic for like Michael uh, to do because he's in Alaska. He's a public land guy who deals with crazy stuff, a lot of water bodies, um, title and non-title. There's a lot of rivers. There's also a lot of coastline in Alaska too. Michael, you got to email me a good place to go in Alaska for a vacation in the summer. Was I, I haven't been to Alaska in 20 years. I used to go every summer with my family. And we had a lot of fun. 
but I kind of lost Alaska. We had to come back up there this summer was we had all kinds of crazy stuff. Had a friend chased by a grizzly bear, <laughs> uh, had a friend burn down a cabin we were staying in. It was <laughs> a lot of good stories. <laughs> You're muted, Michael. Yeah. I'll put you two in touch too, Tony. Yeah, that'd be great. Yep. So any, uh, I hate to uh, end things tonight, but I'm going to st- tell you guys to go out and do some more learning. If you're interested, there's a lot, there's very few books like Clark Brown's evidence procedure has a couple chapters. George Cole does a nice book called water boundaries. It's pretty old, like maybe 15, 20 years old. It's a good book. Uh, Rivers and lakes uh, is a good book to have, but really it's going to be all about your state statutes and your state court cases because um, every state is different and every state applies different rules and uh, you know, just be careful and make smart decisions and tip your toes in the water and get started. But it's a lot of fun to do. I like being on the boat. I enjoy doing the hydrographic side too, which is always fun. Um, So, you know, think about adding another uh, area of practice to your business and you may enjoy it and make some more money than your usual land surveys. So thank you very much for coming, really enjoyed it. And um, keep tuning in. We're gonna do an expert witness, I think in a few months. Thanks everybody, thanks Landon for coming. Thanks Trent for setting this up. This was a great time. And I'm pretty certain we'll do this water boundaries again as an eight hour at some point for somebody. So we'll let you guys know if the whole thing goes to, goes online. Yeah, let me know and then I can can obviously blast that out. And then, James had a quick, real quick one about research for boundary cases. Sure. Yeah. Do, let's see. You know any uh, any specific sites? That's something I was even going to work on here in Nevada and some other ones. Specific state uh, case laws that go. That's something I wanted to do. So. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm spoiled. You know, I, I've got Lexis Nexus Access, which is what attorneys use. Because I'm a author for Lexis, the Clark on surveying books. They give you a free account, unlimited, which is like worth like. A hundred thousand dollars a year, something you know, stupid. But I found this website called Case Clear Text, C L E A R T E X T. I like it. Um, it's free completely. It's like a kind of like a poor man's Lexus Nexus. Uh, also, if you're brave, you can sign up for a free trial of Lexus or Westlaw for like thirty days. Do a bunch of research make a new account in 30 days, you know, (laughs) email accounts are cheap these days. And you will find that the paid services like Lexus and Westlaw, they give you substantially more information than your usual uh, online research like Google Scholar. They'll summarize the case and they put these things called head, um, head notes. So like head note one, the Long Lake method. You click on head note one, and you see every case that's ever used the Long Lake method. They like categorize it for you. It's it's nice. So think about a, a better subscription. Um, Steve says, <laughs> say hello to grandpa. <laughs> um, case text is good. Really, uh, Google Scholar does okay. And the scariest thing of all is I found quite a few cases in regular Google. You know, uh, I have a real... Uh, sticky issue in New Mexico and Taos on the ski slope. And this is a water boundary um, on a Lake Fork River. And I could not find a good case in Lexus or anywhere else. Did a Google search. Like three weeks ago, the Michigan Supreme Court released a, a case that has not been published in any, any online research. They just put it on their website. It solved my problem. I mean, it was, it was crazy. So sometimes regular Google can solve a lot of your problems. Perfect. There you go. That was awesome. All right. Well, well it's been a pleasure. It, Had Thank a good you. time. And uh, definitely keep joining uh, Trent and these guys. These are really informative. So thank you, Trent, for doing this for us. We appreciate it. No problem. Thank, thank you. Tony.